Blessed be your name, Lord, again. Have your way in our midst. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please, you might be seated. We'd like to specially use this period to welcome into our assembly today the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, <laughs> Dr. Goodluck Ebele Jonathan, GCON, GCFR, Commander in Chief. Can we give the Lord a big clap and a shout of praise and a rousy welcome for our President, the President of the largest, pop, most populous black mission in the world. Give the Lord a big clap of hand. Please be seated. We welcome you, sir. We appreciate your presence in our midst. And we want to trust the Lord that this occasion will be an occasion in which God will supply you greater strength, greater help, greater energy for the enormous task of leading a nation as diverse socially, politically, and religiously as this nation. Um, later on, I might be talking about this when we are praying for this nation, the enormity of leading a nation such as this. You may not understand what it means until you have been asked to lead maybe 200 people. And then you will understand the implication of leading 150 million people as diverse as those 150 million interests. We appreciate you, sir. We'd like to also let you know, in our generation, people are very quick to condemn in family, in relationships, a, a, a parent will quickly notice the fault of the child, but not notice when the child performed well. Husband will notice when the wife offended, but will never notice when she did well. The lead will always notice when the leader did anything wrong, but will never notice when he did right. So we are more generous in condemnation than commendation. And it's a, a tragedy that leads to frustration. We want to let you know, sir, that we have appreciated a couple of things. First of all, I was in Israel with His Excellency, where for the first time in the history of this nation, a sitting president leads his cabinet and his government and governors and ministers and legislators and judges to go over to seek the God of Israel and they were and, and was there for literally a week. I had the singular privilege of ministering on the Sunday morning at that occasion by the invitation of the Nigerian Christian Pilgrims Commission. And I cannot forget the scenario when every one of us, including Mr. President, went on his knees with the flags lifted, dedicating Nigeria to God and asking God to help us. We can't help ourselves. It was a scene I can never forget. And, and the Lord ministered to me at that occasion that that action shifted us to another level. I would like to let you know, sir, that we appreciate that and we trust God that it will not just be once and for all, but it will be something that may be probably continued for a little while. And I also remember the admonition, sir, that we had in that meeting when we cited people like Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and James Madison and those presidents of America who built the nation on the Christian Godly Foundation declaring national days of prayer and fasting as, as holidays for people, in, I mean, to say, let's seek the Lord. I am sure that as we seek God further in this nation with the kind of scenario that we have, we will go further and further and further in the precious name of Jesus Christ. We also noticed that in, at that occasion, there was a strengthening of our tie with the nation of Israel. There was the bilateral air service agreement that was signed, the BASA agreement, in which uh, the, 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 the Nigerian flights can go straight to Israel, and from Israel straight here, it was a strengthening of the tie. The Bible makes it clear that anyone who relates with Israel and relates positively 
is going to be blessed. If you look at the nations that have anything positive, meaningful with Israel, you will understand what I'm talking about. We appreciate that. We appreciate the signing into law, uh, the, 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 the bill against homosexuality. We appreciate in Nigeria. Give the Lord a, a shout of praise. We refuse that such an evil be perpetrated in Nigeria. The Bible says righteousness exhausts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I believe that Nigeria is moving on and the gates of hell shall not prevail. We appreciate you, we salute you, sir, and we believe that God will further guide you in more strategic and decisive decisions for the benefit of this country. Give the Lord another shout of praise. You might be seated in the presence of the Lord. I have a short exhortation very quickly. We know that the month we have been is the month of covenant, blessed beyond measure through the covenant. We have seen the demands of what it means to walk in covenant with God. The place Abraham walked, the place Isaac walked, where Solomon walked, where people like Job walked, the relationship they had with God, and the results of those relationships. We saw all of that. We began to look at the demands of the covenant and the details of the covenant. And before the month was going to be over, the Lord impressed on my heart for us to deal with anti-covenant practices. The kind of things that people in covenant relationship with God must not dare, must not practice. Anti-covenant practice. I said in the first service, and also in the second service I said, that there are practices that confirm identity. There are practices you see with a lion and you know this is a lion. In the second service, I talked about the practices of an, of, of, of an elephant. Now, for example, the eagle, there are practices that makes an eagle an eagle. Once you see a bird, you can say this is an eagle and not a vulture. For example, the eagle does not eat anything that is rotten. The vulture can taste corruption, but not the eagle. The eagle will not touch any flesh that is stinky. That is characteristic of the eagle. For example also, the eagle is married to one wife for life. It has one mate. It does not mismate or crossmate. That is an identity of the eagle. Also once in a year, the eagle will fast for almost 40 days, drinking only water on the top of the rock. It will shed old feather and then gain new feather and get ready for the new year. That is the eagle. Once you see these characteristics, you can know that this is an eagle. So there are practices that confirm identity. Until you have the practices of the eagle, you do not have the identity of an eagle. As it is in, in, in that realm, so it is in the spiritual there are practices of covenant people. There are practices that make the covenant walk with God to produce. And there are practices that make, that are counterproductive for the covenant. There are things that we do with God that makes God to look away. That make, makes God to say, okay, go and help yourself. And we're looking at five of those anti-covenant practices. The first one we looked at, we called it begging and borrowing begging a life where god is pushed into the background and then somebody is trying to find out his own way the bible said in, in, in proverbs chapter 22 and in verse 7 it said the rich ruleth over the poor and the borrower is the servant of the lender we looked at that <clears throat> exhaustively in the first service and i think that it is good for you to pick up that message in the second service we looked at confidence in man the service that just finished where people take their eyes off God and begin to look at a human connection or look at a human source, a human wisdom, or a, a human ability to take them to their destination. It's an anti-covenant practice. Abraham refused to look, look up to the king of Gerah. He said, I've lifted up my eyes to the creator of heaven. I will not look at you in case you say I made Abraham rich. I'm going to read that in Genesis chapter 14 verse 22. Let's read it. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a tread even to a shoe lashing. 
and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. I, I won't look up to you. I won't make you a God in my life. I won't allow you to take the place of God in my life. Abraham said that. And I believe that that was a major reason why God worked with Abraham the way he worked with. Now, the third one we are dealing with is fraudulent practice. Fraudulent practice. I will deal with that in this service. And then the fourth is acting without discretion. That is moving, acting by sight instead of by discretion. Covenant people, they are strategic in the things they do. People who have a relationship with God, they don't just take actions anyhow. They, 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 they weigh their options and calculate their steps in the presence of God before they move. I will look at that in the fourth service. And finally, is the impossibility mentality. It's an anti-covenant practice. People who, who believe in God believe all things are possible. People who believe in God, they move in the realm of the possibility of all things. That is for the fifth service. But I am going to look at Number three right now, which is called the fraudulent practice, is not a practice of covenant people. Look at what Abraham said again in Genesis chapter 14, verse 22 and 23. He said, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a tread even to a shoe lashing, and that I will not take anything that is dying. That is the key. I will not take anything that is thine. Covenant people don't take what they are not licensed to take. People who walk with God, they don't allocate, them, allocate to themselves what is not their right. It is a totally anti-covenant practice. I will not take what is thine. We look at the story of Job also. He had a testimony. In Job chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. The Bible said there was a man in the land of Oz. Whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright. One that feared God and eschewed evil. The Bible said and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep. And 3,000 camels. And 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east the greatest but where did this start from the bible said he was upright he was somebody who feared god and eschewed evil i like us to look at other translations the living bible puts it this way he said there lived in the land of us a man named job a good man who feared god and stayed away from evil he had a large family of seven sons and three daughters and was immensely wealthy for he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, 500 female donkeys and employed many servants. He was in fact the richest cattle man in the entire area. The, 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 the thing that strikes me is that this man was upright and yet unusually blessed and influential in his generation. What that says to me is, is that uprightness does not equal wretchedness. What that says to me is that it is possible to be absolutely upright and be totally free from wretchedness. What that says is, integrity is combinable with prosperity. That this man was the richest man in the east, but he was a man who feared God. He eschewed evil. One translation said he was a honest man. Was that the good news of the Amplified or the Bible in basic English? He was a honest man. He was a honest man and he eschewed evil. My dear brothers and sisters, nobody has a destiny with God where there is a lack of integrity. Nobody has a destiny with God, whether it is moral integrity or financial integrity. Nobody has a destiny with God. The covenant people like Abraham, like Job, they stayed away from evil. You remember Adam was told by God, you can eat every fruit in the, in, in the garden, but the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. For in the day you eat it, you shall die. 
Adam had 99% of food to eat. But he decided to touch the one that God said he should not touch. He ate one fruit and lost a whole garden. He took the fruit and God drove him out. What I said you should eat and the one I say you should not eat, don't eat any of them at all again. He had to leave that garden and go and till the ground and suffer for daily bread. My dear brothers and sisters, what God has not given to you does not add to you. Whatever God has not given to you takes away from you. It takes something away from you. You remember the case of Achan. Achan, who served Elisha. When the, the Naaman the prophet came, Achan greedily went after Naaman. And what happened? No, no, sorry, I'm talking of Gehazi now. Achan, in, in Joshua chapter 7 verse 20, when they went to fight against Ai, God told them not to touch anything there. Achan saw a Babylonish garment and took it. And the whole of Achan's family and his life and his possession perished for touching what he was not licensed to touch. Gehazi followed after Naaman and pursued Naaman. When Elisha will not collect a pin from Naaman, Gehazi with the eye of covetousness followed after Naaman and took from Naaman what he was not licensed to take. And Elisha said, the leprosy of Naaman, Gehazi, is coming upon you and your seed forever. So, crookedness today equals affliction tomorrow. The leprosy of Naaman is coming upon you. Elisha had asked Gehazi, where are you coming from? He said, I'm coming from nowhere. But Elisha said, did not my soul go with you? When the man came down and gave you those things, didn't I see you? The leprosy of Gehazi comes upon you. Beloved, of Naaman comes upon Gehazi. My dear brothers and sisters, whatever is not correct today will ruin us tomorrow. It's an anti-covenant practice. Those who walk with God, they stay away from what they are not licensed to get. Is somebody here say aloud, Amen. Do we have scriptures? Proverbs chapter 14 verse 11. I'm going to read several versions here. Proverbs chapter 14 and in verse 11. It says, The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 11. As the partridge seated on eggs, and hatched them not. So he that getteth riches. And not by right. He shall live it in the midst of his days. And at his end he shall be a fool. Getting it without right. Makes a man end as a fool. You know the challenge of our, our land. It's when you are preaching a preaching like this. Somebody may be looking at somebody else and say they are not talking to me. But I have researched and I have seen that I was invited to preach somewhere at an anti-corruption place. And by the time I, I spoke with the people, everybody saw himself there. Take your seat. What does it mean to be fraudulent? It means to sit in an exam hall. And begin to cheat in an exam. And graduate with a certificate. And get a job you did not deserve. It is an anti-covenant practice. What does it mean to be fraudulent? It means to buy GCE question answers. Answers. Answer them at home, come out with flying colors, and graduate with a certificate that is not yours. 
a man listening to our television program and it sent to me somewhere from a part of this country. He said, I feel like tearing my ICANN certificate. And I said, why? He said, I didn't get it rightfully. He said, and I don't mind starting afresh. And beloved brothers and sisters, there are many children of God who are praying to God to bless them, to help them. But there is a lot of crookedness. Somebody came to our Bible school and it was his dead brother's certificate that he used to enter to come and study Bible. Are you following what I'm saying now? It was his dead brother's certificate. He came to study Bible with him in Bible school. And he's expecting the blessing of God. Take your seat. Somebody came to me one time and she said, sir, can you pray for me? I'm trusting God for a job. When I looked at the CV she pr presented, her age on the CV appears to me like 10 years younger. So I said, but this age does not look like your age. He said, it's true, sir. They told me if I don't reduce my age, I won't get the job. And I said, and you want the God of heaven to lay hands on a lie and bless you on a lie. He doesn't work. Beloved brothers and sisters, God is real and God is strict and God is strong. What about the lecturer? that decides to award marks in exchange for some moral decadence or forces the children to buy handouts they did not need. And maybe he's in church too and he wants God to bless his career. It's an Abraham said, I will not take what is yours. I won't take what is yours. I want heaven to bless me. I can't take what is yours. Is God speaking to anybody here today? Please take your seat. Someone may come to work by 10 a.m. And he's meant to appear by 7.30. And he wrote 7.25. And he wants God to bless him on that walk. What of the employee? They sent him to go and buy things for, for his organization. And he enters an agreement with this, the seller. And these days in our country, even if it's church equipment, whatever it is, you go and somebody will ask you, how much should I write on the receipt? In other words, you are being encouraged to be false. You are being encouraged to be deceit, deceitful. And we must come to the point where we are going to say to God, to them, no, sir. How much should you write on the receipt? How much did I buy it? Someone travels and fails to retire accounts. Someone travels with junior colleagues and the money is meant to give to them as their travel allowance. It, it, it destroys it and gives them a peanut and Jehovah is watching. And this person wants the blessing of God. Abraham said, I will not take what is thine and add to me. So when we talk about this, it, it, it permeates every area, every dimension. Let me come home closer. What of the housewife that makes a list? The market list that is not true. Because he needs money. He needs money from the husband. It's, it's, fr it's fraudulent. It's corrupt. If that, if that housewife see big money, she will steal big money. Are you following what I'm saying here? What of students? Students that write fictitious lists to their father. Any student here now? You know I'm talking to you. You know the list of books you wrote is not correct. You know there is no book like that.
take your seat in the presence of the Lord. And you can go on and on. What of the pastor that decides that he becomes a pastor because of money? What of the man that is duping people in the name of God? What of the one they gave him money belonging to church and he diverts it to himself? communicating now and it doesn't matter who we are whether you are a pastor a housewife or a student if you are not straight in your dealings you jeopardize your destiny with God in this world and in the world to come is God still speaking to somebody here what of the person mix, mixing petrol and kerosene or mixing petrol with something else in order to increase profiteering. And it has led to maybe a house being set on fire somewhere. What about the petroleum st station? That the, the, the gauge is never zero. There is nothing you can do for that thing to start from zero. It's permanently hanging in the air. The man set it so. There are some that run faster than normal. Using air to pump. Is God speaking to somebody here? What are the commodities trader that is mixing flour, baking powder with, with alubo? <laughs> to increase profit. What about the one that is making many bags of cement out of some bags? He has to cut the head and rebag. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? And God is looking at all these things. And many of all of us are still in church. And we are saying, God is not helping us. He's not helping me. Beloved, we must come to the point where we are going to say to God, what you did not give me, I will not dare it. Is God speaking to anybody here? What you have not given me, Lord, is not mine. We have seen from Job and we have seen from Abraham that it is possible to be upright and be blessed. Is God speaking to somebody here today? Take your seat. I, and I was sharing this in that meeting and I told people, I said, what about the tailor that you, 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 you gave him the cloth to sew for you and he uses the balance of the yard to sew to another person and he could not tell you that only four yards was enough and he said six yards because he wanted to use two yards and maybe he's in church too. What about the mechanic that you pay him for brand new carburetor and he, he he washes your old carburetor and fixes it back and he's asking for the blessing of God these are anti-covenant practices you can be neat and be blessed you can be clean and be up you don't have to be crooked to succeed and the truth of the matter is what we are talking about does not just talk about blessing on earth but in eternity please take your seat hallelujah I believe that these are the things God is talking about it goes to the contractor too paid big money to do quality work Maybe a substandard work is done that led to the death of people. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And God is watching. Or to the officer in his organization who channeled the money of the people for personal use. All these are in the same line. The child that stole a pencil in class is the same. And everybody here who is a proprietress or, or, or a school principal, please don't raise crooks. 
Because we have experienced schools where teachers are permitting children to cheat in the class. And even organizing the cheating for them. And look away during invigilations in exam. God is watching all these things. There are places they call special centers we used to hear about. Miracle centers. Where nobody fails exam. If you take a dollar there, you will come out with AAA. The, the, but the terrible thing is that they cannot defend that degree. So we have graduates who cannot construct any, any straight English. Master's holder, he can't speak a straight English. So you ask him, where did you get that master from? But the Lord will help us. So what is, please take, take your seat as I round off. What are the implications of, of, of fraudulent practices? First, it is, a tra it is transgression against the laws of God that attracts the curse. At whatever level it is, it is transgression against the laws of God and attracts the curse. Secondly, it displays a lack of confidence in God to provide legitimately for us. A lack of confidence. When we begin to do things, begin to rebag and do things and do that, we are telling God that I, am not, I, I don't trust you to provide for me. I am not sure you can be my provider. And thirdly, it charges God with unfairness. God has made other people bigger than me. Let me struggle to be big too. God is not fair to me. It charges God with unfairness. It's a display of impatience. A display of covetousness. What is my counsel this morning? First, please look away from what is not yours. If it is not yours legally, by labor or by favor, because you can get by labor, you can get by favor, you can get by your wisdom, if it is not yours, by labor, by favor, by wisdom, look away from it. Secondly, I will ask that you labor honestly and diligently. Labor honestly and diligently. And thirdly, look up to the rewarder of the diligent laborer. There is a God who rewards. Nobody may may see your genuine labor now but there is a God who rewards labor and by the time we have exercised our conscience to be void of offense towards man and towards God there is an eternity after this world there is, there is a life in the afterlife he says it is appointed unto man once to die and after that is the judgment at this moment I am going to pray for everyone that is here this morning and is in need of mercy from God. Can we stand up on our feet? Lift up your right hand where you are. I am in covenant relationship with God. Somebody may be saying today, and I don't want to carry out any practice that is anti-covenant. I don't want to. I don't want to do anything that will make God to look away. I want to be faithful and dedicated. Lift up your right hand. Thank God for his word that you have heard. First. Father, we give you the praise. We give you the honor. Thank you for your word today. And right now, I'm going to pray for everyone. You are saying, Pastor, in many ways, I don't think God is happy with my life. I am sure I have erred, I have offended God in too many ways and I need forgiveness from my sins. Anywhere you are, pray this prayer with me and say, Lord Jesus, louder, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I need help from you. Forgive me my sins. Today, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. From today, I go forward ever, backward never. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.